All right, it's time to start the final unit of physics 30, atomic physics. So we're gonna break this unit up into four parts. So the first part, what we'd like to talk about is this thing called the charge to mass ratio along with Thompson's experiment. And we'd also like to talk about the Rutherford model of the atom. So we're gonna delve into this right away. So by the time we got to the 19th century, there was a chemist named John Dalton and he proposed an atomic theory. So Dalton's atomic theory, it was a pretty good start to, you know, the whole idea of atomic physics, but there were some flaws with it. So Dalton's theory had four kind of mean points to it. He stated that all matter is made of atoms, which are indivisible and indestructible. So he had what was called the billiard ball model of the atom. The atom was like kind of a billiard ball. That was it. You couldn't delve any further. And nowadays, we know that's not correct because we know there's things like neutrons, the whole protons, electrons, all that. So we know that statement's false. All atoms of a given element are identical in mass and properties. You may not know this part right now, but that's also incorrect. We're going to talk about something called isotopes later. So that's going to invalidate that part. Compounds are formed by a combination of two or more different kinds of atoms. That is actually correct. So Dalton gets to be correct on this one. And then lastly, a chemical reaction is just a rearrangement of atoms. So that is actually true. So Dalton, his four major points, he got two of the four right, but the other two are not correct. So these other two points, we're going to look at that in a bit more depth in this course. And the first part has to deal with this thing called the cathode ray experiment. And this was done by a gentleman from the United Kingdom named J.J. Thompson. So what he had done is he had devised this experiment and what he had was he had this evacuated vacuum tube and he hooked up parallel plates on both ends and applied a potential difference across them. So what he noticed is that there was like a mysterious ray that flowed between the two plates. And this is what he referred to as cathode rays. Now what Thompson had tried to do is he wanted to try and separate the negative charges from that cathode ray beam. What Thompson didn't know at the start is that the cathode ray beam was just a bunch of negatively charged particles. So then eventually Thompson did figure out that, yeah, the cathode rays were negatively charged. It wasn't something made up of like negative charges and positive charges. They were just negatively charged particles. Now, the next part, what Thompson wanted to do is he wanted to see if those negatively charged particles in the cathode ray would deflect under the influence of electric field. In theory, we know it should, but what Thompson had found is that he didn't actually notice any effect, but he hypothesized the reason for this is that those cathode rays, what they had done is they had ionized the air molecules around it, and then what had happened is that those ions had shielded the cathode rays from the electric field. So Thompson then did modify his experiment a little bit, and what he did was he tried to do something, he tried to get a near perfect vacuum inside the discharge tube to get rid of as much air as possible. So then without the air, there was no ionization of those air molecules. And Thompson did indeed observe the bending of cathode rays when an electric field was present. So what Thompson had shown is that there was the existence of this fundamental particle that happens to have a negative charge. Nowadays, we know this as the electron. So Thompson's sort of the father of the electron. Originally, he named them corpuscles. Eventually, the name kind of got changed to what we now know today, the lovely electron. Now, one of the things that Thompson was able to do was he was able to calculate this thing called the charge to mass ratio. At the time, they were not able to determine the elementary charge, which was done by Millikan, whom we talked about earlier, and they also didn't know the mass, but they were able to find this ratio of charge to mass. And the way Thompson did this was by using knowledge of electric and magnetic fields. So we have to kind of go through how this was done. So we recall when we looked at electric fields, we could find the electric force acting on a particle. The electric force would just be the charge times the electric field strength. And then when we were studying magnetic fields, we know that the magnitude of the magnetic force is just going to be the charge times the speed times the magnitude of the magnetic field. So those are equations that we have already studied. Now, what Thompson could do, and this is sort of the special case, he could adjust the electric and magnetic fields that the cathode ray passed through, such that the electron would not be deflected. So it would pass through sort of in a straight line. So what we could say on this case is that the net force on the electron would be zero. So what that means 
is that if we look at the net force, we could say the net force acting on this thing, the electrostatic force plus the magnetic force, that's going to equal to zero. Now, through some clever rearrangements of having the magnitude of the electric force balance the magnitude of the magnetic force, we know that Fe is just this QE, we know that Fm is QVB, so what that does is that allows us to rearrange this to get this little formula here, this V equals the magnitude of the electric field strength divided by the magnitude of the magnetic field strength. So V is still going to be our speed in meters per second, electric field strength, newton per coulomb, or volts per meter, and then B is the magnitude of that magnetic field strength, which is in Teslas. So this is what we sometimes refer to as the velocity selector formula. So in forces and field, when we talked about mass spectrometers, we talked about the velocity selector where particles pass through in a straight line undeflected. That formula there is what we would use to find the speed of the particle. It's only valid though when that particle's undeflected. If it happens to be bent, we can't use that. And we've also looked at that case in forces and fields. So we can use that equation. So what Thompson was able to do, or sorry, when Thompson measured the deflection of the rays when he was dealing with the electric and magnetic fields, he observed that those deflections of the cathode rays depended on the following. It depended on the magnitude of the actual field strengths, the length that the particle had traveled in the field, the speed of the particles, the charge of the particles, and the mass of the particles. So as I said, Thompson was able to kind of deal with the first three no problem. It's these two bits here though, the charge and the mass. He couldn't figure those out individually. But as I mentioned, Thompson didn't really need to know those in order to do his work. By calculating the ratio between them, he was able to advance his work significantly. Now, the other thing is what Thompson had done is he wanted to use different sets of metals to produce the cathode rays. What he had found is that regardless of the type of metal he used, the cathode rays always had a consistent value for the charge to mass ratio. So what Thompson was, had concluded from this is that every single cathode ray was consisting of identical particles with the same negative charge. Again, these are what we know as electrons. So Thompson showed that the charge to mass ratio for an electron was about 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram which told people that it's about a thousand, it's so that charge to mass ratio, it's about a thousand times larger than that for a proton. So what this did is it gave credence to the idea that atoms were not the smallest unit of matter. There was actually something even smaller inside. So this was actually the first bit of evidence that invalidated Dalton's model. Now, the thing is, Dalton's model was held in high regards. And the whole thing with the atom came from that Greek word atomos, which means uncuttable. So the dominating theory was that the atom could not be divided into smaller parts. And now you have this theory that said it is made of smaller bits. So people did have difficulty accepting Thompson's model. But eventually it did gain momentum. Thompson did make a little bit of a mess up. He proposed that electrons were the building blocks of chemical elements. That's not true. Electrons make up part of the chemical element, but they are not the building blocks of it. But still, his work advanced atomic physics quite significantly. So his discovery of the electron and the charge to mass ratio allowed the discipline to move forward. So we started to get going a little bit. Now, this whole charge to mass ratio, let's look at it. So charge to mass ratio, we're going to look at the case when an electron happens to be deflected by a magnetic field. So when we recall from the forces and fields unit, when we had a charged particle entering a magnetic field, it underwent circular motion or it experienced the centripetal force. So we would have said that that centripetal force was provided by the magnetic force. So we're dealing with magnitudes here. We know centripetal force is mv squared over r. We know fm is qvb. So what we would like to rearrange for is we would like to rearrange for this ratio of q over m. And if we get that, this q over m is equal to the speed of the particles divided by the magnitude of the magnetic field strength multiplied by the radius of curvature. So our charge to mass ratio will be coulombs per kilogram. V is going to be the speed in meters per second. B is going to be that magnitude of the magnetic field strength in Teslas. And R is going to be our radius of curvatures. So many times when we're dealing with this equation, we're dealing with 
dealing with it in the context of a mass spec and chances are you're not going to be given the speed explicitly. What's probably going to happen is the particle is going to go through a velocity selector and it's undeflected and then the electric field is going to shut off and then it's going to be in a magnetic field only where it's going to undergo circular motion. So in that case you're probably going to want to get the magnetic field or sorry the velocity from this equation here this V equals E over B. If you have trouble finding V this is most likely what you're using. Check for that word undeflected or net force on the particle being zero. So let's look at an example. So somebody they're trying to recreate Thompson's experiments to determine the mass of an electron and they have a cathode ray tube it's set up with an electric field of 1.86 times 10 to the 4 newtons per coulombs and then there is a magnetic field strength of 5.80 times 10 to the minus 4 teslas. So these settings result in the electron traveling straight through when they're both turned on. After shutting down the electric field, we know that the path of the electron has a radius of 0.325 meters. We would like to determine the charge to mass ratio using the experimental data, and we're going to compare with the experimental result, or the, compare the experimental result with the accepted value. So that we'll have to calculate that. So first of all, experimentally. So there's kind of two parts going on here. First of all, we're told that we're traveling straight through. So this is undeflected. What we know when the particle is undeflected is we know that the net force is going to be zero, or we know that the magnitude of the magnetic force is balanced out by the magnitude of the electric force. So we know that QVB is just going to be QE. Now, the charge cancels out, we don't care about that, and what we get is that the speed of this thing is the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. So this is going to allow us to determine, first of all, the speed of our particle. So the speed of our particle based on what we have, the speed of our particle, we can calculate that. And what we're going to find is that the speed of the particle in this context, it's about 3.207 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So this is the speed of the particle as it's passing through the velocity selector. Now, it's going to leave the velocity selector. The electric field is going to be turned off, which means the particle is now going to undergo circular motion. So when it undergoes circular motion, this is where it's going to only have the magnetic field. So in this case here, we know that the centripetal force is just going to be provided by the magnetic force. So we know that we have centripetal force mv squared over r, and this is going to be equal to qvb for the magnetic force. So one of the v's is going to take a hike here, and we'd like to get q over m. Well, q over m is going to be v divided by VR. So this V here, this is the V that comes from the velocity selector, comes from where the particle is undeflected. So that's what we had just found previously, so that's what we're going to dump in there. We're told the magnetic field strength, we're told the radius of curvature. The magnetic field strength didn't change, so we're going to assume it's the same as it was in the velocity selector. So we have that speed, we're going to divide it by the magnetic field strength. And then we'll also multiply that by the radius of curvature. Again, in your calculator, don't forget to put brackets around the denominator just so you are getting everything nice and correct. So if we do that, we're going to get about 1.70 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. So this is the charge to mass ratio for an electron based on the experimental data that's given. So let's look at the accepted value. So the accepted value, we want Q over M. Well, we know the charge of the electron nowadays is this 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, the elementary charge, and the mass of the electron on the data sheet is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So if we look at that, we are going to get about 1.76 times 10 to the 11 
coulombs per kilogram. So not too bad actually, we were pretty close. Let's do a bit of a percent discrepancy, like let's see, or percent difference, let's just see what we got here. So that percent difference, we're going to do the experimental minus the theoretical divided by the theoretical, and we're going to multiply it by 100%. So let's see how well they did in this experiment. So experimentally they got 1.70 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. We're going to take off the actual value and we're going to divide that by the actual value. And then we take the absolute value because we don't care about negatives and we're going to multiply it by 100%. So I kind of cram my work in there. So let's see what we get. So based on what we get here, we are going to get about 3%. So based on this person's experiment, they got a percent difference of about 3%. I would say they did an absolutely fantastic job. To get a percent difference under 5% in a lab setting, you're doing beautiful. So good job to them. Great. The last thing we want to talk about just quickly here is we want to talk about actual Thompson. So Thompson discovered the electron. Well, Thompson also proposed his own model of the atom, known as the Thompson model. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the raisin bun model or the plum pudding model. So basically what Thompson theorized is this. So we kind of have our atom here. Now, the, I don't have the best scientific terminology, but what Thompson thought is that there was this kind of like, we'll call it positive goo, and inside this positive goo, electrons were embedded. Kind of like in this raisin bun here, we have this dough, and then we have this raisins embedded in the dough. So the dough is meant to act as a positive charge, and then the raisins are meant to act as the electrons or the negative charge. So Thompson knew that the electrons were, or, or sorry, that the atom was neutral, but if he had to have electrons in it, there had to be something to balance those electrons out to ensure the overall atom was neutral. So that's where we kind of get the positive charge from this massless goo or blob that we want to call it. So that's kind of Thompson's model. Massless positive blob, electrons embedded in that blob. Now, just to throw back quickly to tie this up and finish this. So we talked about how Millikan was able to determine the charge or the elementary charge. Well, we already knew the charge to mass ratio thanks to Thompson. If we knew Q over M, once Millikan was able to determine Q, this also allowed him to determine the mass of the electron as well. So some people might say, well, Thompson's work, who cares about the charge to mass ratio? Well, that opened up a lot of possibilities and it helped advance science. Once Millikan was able to find Q, he was able to find M as well. And he was, wouldn't have been able to do that without the work of Thompson. So that's the thing. We might not think something's useful now, but somebody may take what we've done previously and help advance that. So we always want to, try, well, I guess the lesson on this is like, never discount what you do. It may have some value. You just may not see it at the present time.